Well, again, good morning. Uh, I'm Brian Beard, and, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to get a chance to share a message with you. So go with me in prayer now. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your eyes. Amen. So um, most of you may not know, but last month, my wife and I, Janelle, we celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. Now, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, probably not too long for some of y'all, but a little long for some of y'all. But, uh, but yes, it's, it, it, the time just flies. But it started off a little rocky thanks to the Air Force. See, uh, I, I got, we got married, went on a honeymoon, and two weeks later, I went on a remote tour to, to Korea by myself. Probably didn't win the New Husband of the Year award for that one. So, uh, so uh, but we had a game plan. Uh, I was going to go get all settled in, and then Janelle was going to follow me over and spend, uh, spend some time with me uh, there in Korea. Now, Janelle grew up on a cattle farm in, uh, in, in southern Nebraska, kind of the Nebraska-Kansas uh, uh, border. And other than that area, she kind of hadn't been out of the state, but just maybe four or five times in her life, and certainly not across the ocean to Asia. So it was a big change. So finally the day came, and, and she hopped on the airplane, and I met her at uh, Kimpo Airport in Seoul, Korea. Uh, she came out of customs, and we fell into each other's arms and got reacquainted. And then we, we got our bags, and we shuffled off and hopped in a, in a cab real quick. And we were going to go downtown Seoul uh, in this little area called Itaewon. And now we're going to spend the weekend there getting reacquainted and, and then uh, head down to, my, uh, to the base that I was stationed at. And so we hopped into the cab, and we were still kind of getting reacquainted, and we didn't really pay attention to much around us. And, and we drove up to the, uh, the hotel. So I got out and I came around to start getting the bags out. Well, Janelle got out of the cab. I looked up and she was almost paralyzed. See the heat of Korea, the humidity of Korea, the smell of, of Korea and the hustle and bustle of the, of the city. For a moment, almost paralyzed her with that change. And then I hugged her, and we moved, and we, we, we moved on. But the idea that change, change could maybe paralyze you if it's so great. You know, there's all kind of change that goes on in, in our life. All right, some's big, some small. You know, the, 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 the little changes like maybe, uh, maybe the gas price is fluctuating. That's irritating, but we can, you know, we, we can deal with that change. Maybe the change of a sinkhole over by Lowe's that alters the speedway and coal for a while. That was irritating, but, uh, but we dealt with that change. But there's also big change that goes on. Maybe getting married or having kids or changing a job or getting a certain diagnosis or, or maybe losing a loved one. Big things that change our life forever. All this change going on around us in this beautiful world. Well, how do we as Christians, how do we deal with this change? Well, this is, this is the first start. See, we're part of a community. We're part of a friendship in Christ that we can depend on each other to help us through any challenge that, that we face in our life. But moreover, you know, we, we have the Lord with us. Every step of the way, as we go through this life and deal with the challenges and the changes we experience, we have the Lord with us. We just have to ask for help, and he'll help us. So now, long before my, 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 I met my lovely wife, back when I was a senior in high school, I dated this young lady who was a Methodist minister's daughter. Now, um, uh, I had met her, and we started dating, and I met her parents, fantastic people. And they were for, not from the church I was in, but a couple towns over is where he had, uh, where he had his church. So, um, so one Sunday, I was invited for, uh, for, the, um, for the service. And so we went over there, a fantastic preacher, just, just amazing little Southern, uh, Southern Methodist minister. So afterwards, I was invited for the, the Sunday fried chicken after church lunch, and it was awesome. And so as we sat there, um, the, uh, Brother Corley and I started out on this amazing conversation about all the different preachers 
that we had knew and had in common. See, I was in, I grew up in a small Methodist church and there was always the Methodist ministers moving in and out. We had uh, Brother Thomas and Brother Poole as retired visitation ministers. There was Brother Blunt and uh, Brother McLean. And uh, we also went through a couple of uh, district superintendents in school. In fact, one Sunday, we had a district superintendent over to our house and my poor mom spilt a bowl of gravy right in his lap. As, <laughs> Welcome to Nacogdoches. Well, welcome to the church. Thank you for, for coming. But a great introduction to our church. But, uh, and we razz my poor mom about that for, for, the, for the rest of her life. And so at some point, uh, my girlfriend looked at me and she goes, how do you know all of these ministers? And, and it occurred to me that you know, we had, I had always been in the church as the recipient of the change but she, on the other hand, was always part of that change, moving with her dad. See, that, that change, you know, affected us in, in different ways. And that's like it is in life. Things go on and it always affects us in different ways. We have the faith to see, that, to see ourselves through. Now, it was said that, uh, that John Wesley preached over 40,000 sermons in his, in his lifetime, 40,000 sermons. And, and he believed that getting out into the community, preaching, building a community of Christ, standing up churches, standing up education institutions to spread the word of God and to spread the Methodist faith. So when that migrated across the ocean, the, the same philosophy, uh, the same philosophy migrated with it, stood up edu- uh, institutions to educate, and Methodist ministers, much like they do today, they they moved around. So a Methodist minister would be uh, would be assigned maybe a portion of a state or or a district, and the Methodist minister would go into a, a town, spend three or four months setting up a community of Christ and giving sermons and getting liked minded people together. And then he would pick up and go to the next town and set up another community. And then the next village and the next town and the next town. And eventually he would start that circuit again. Thus, the tradition we have in the Methodist church about the circuit rider. That was the foundation of of, a Methodist. And And then of course we had institutions. Uh, that we would set up, that the Methodist Church set up uh, to spread education and spread the word. Boston University started out as a Methodist, uh, a Methodist institution. Duke was associated with, with Methodist. Of course, uh, there's Southern Methodist University in Dallas today, and Texas Wesleyan, and Kansas, and Nebraska Wesleyan, all these, uh, all these universities that over time, as the Methodist faith spread across the states, stood up. Now, the idea of Methodist ministers changing. So uh, this week, uh, our church went through annual conference. And of course, an annual conference, they deal with big issues, you know, the politics of the church and and, uh, all the different books of discipline, all the different items in the book of discipline. Methodist church is strong. But it's also about this time around around, uh, the annual conference that the Methodist church chooses to move its ministers. And of course, we all know we're in the, right in the middle of that move right now. You know, last week we said a tearful and joy, but joyful goodbye to Candace, thanking her for all she did for, for this church. I mean, she came in and we had two campuses and we, we developed this community. We looked outside in the community around us and we had all the programs to help our community. Yeah, she led us through the challenging time of COVID. She came in, she planted her seed and with our help, it grew. It grew into our church that we know today. But in our faith, says Methodist ministers at some point need to pick up and move and experience a new church and bring their talents to a different church. And she's gonna do that up in Chandler. But of course, we're gonna get Reverend Brooke. Reverend Brooke's gonna come in and she's gonna have her ideas. She's gonna plant her seed here. And with our help, she will grow this church. We will grow and we will all grow, we will all grow together. Now I gotta think, I gotta think that somewhere 
And that whole idea of Methodist ministers moving and changing, our scripture today is tied up in there somewhere. So let's return to that scripture. Jesus Christ said, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it will never be anything but a grain of wheat. But if it's buried, it sprouts, it re reproduces itself many times. It reproduces itself. And it goes on to say, in the same way, Jesus said, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let go in reckless love, let go, you'll have that life forever, both here and the life eternal. Change is going to happen. He said, let it go. If you hold on to life as it is today, it will surely die. If you change and grow, he wanted us to change and grow in our faith so we could serve, so we could serve him better. Now, change is tough. We know it. It's hard. It's, it's easy just to, to do the same thing over and over and not change. But he said, let it go. Change and you will grow. Plant your seed and watch it and watch it grow. So most of the change that we experience today has to do around technology. I mean, there's always a new app for something. There's always a new diet out there trying to get us to lose weight. Something new in technology is going to save our lives. Technology. Well, let's, let's go to an example of, of that technology and change. So how many people remember Blockbuster, the movie store, right? So you go into Blockbuster and you rent a VCR tape. Well, I hope everybody knows what a VCR tape is. Right? My kids say they saw one in a museum once. But at, time, at that time, uh, their, their business model would you go in, you'd rent, you go up, and, and, and there was aisles of VCR tapes. You go in, you rent a movie, take it home and watch it. So you go in, maybe you go, I want to watch Indiana Jones. So you go, there was the boxes, you look, no tape, you look, no tape. Oh, you found a tape, you could take it and rent it. Now, uh, they would even rent you a VCR machine. And so you go in, maybe on the weekend, rent four or five movies, rent the, rent, rent the VCR uh, machine, and go home and watch the movies, and then you'd have to return it to the store. So popular that Blockbuster grew to 9,000 stores. 9,000, very popular. Now, at some point, though, Rose, at some point, this little business called Netflix, this little startup, rose, right? So, um, so their business model, now, 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 over time, you know, the technology had increased. Their business model was, uh, oh, it, 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 technology increased. So, so not only did we transition from VCRs to DVDs, right, this thing called the Internet happened. All right, and so the internet grew, and now we became, uh, we became accustomed to getting news and buying things on the internet. So the Netflix model was this. You could go online, pick your movie, order it. They'd mail it to you. You'd watch it for a couple of days. They even gave you a returned envelope to mail it back. Pretty slick. It was new. It was you know, leveraging new technology. Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix. Instead, they held on to the old way. They were convinced that people would still come in the store, shop, and then return the movies to the store. They didn't want anything part of this new technology. Today, Blockbuster, they went, they've gone from 9,000 stores to one, somewhere in Oregon. They didn't let go of the past. They didn't accept the change. On the other hand, Netflix went from just ridding, ridding DVDs, but they had a vision. The next vision was streaming movies online. And then the next vision was making their own movies. Wildly successful. Blockbuster did not change and it destroyed them. Kodak. Uh, uh, Polaroid, 
versus digital cameras and Shutterfly. They didn't accept the change and they withered away. IBM, the once great computing power, big mainframe computers, didn't really get the whole personal computer, the PC thing, because they weren't aboard with the new technology, almost withered, almost withered away. If you don't let go, you can't grow. So today, today uh, in, in business, uh, there's this whole discipline that's, that's risen called change management. You can even get a degree in change management. What, is it, what, is it, what does it do? Well, bit large companies, maybe the new technology or there's a new process, they want to in, in, implement this new technology to make their business processes more efficient. And so they, they set off on this change management uh, plan, and it goes something like this. First of all, you have to prepare for change. Okay, why are we changing? What do we want to do? And what outcome do we want to see? So you got to prepare for this change. Next, you just can't jump right in. You got a plan. So you got to set goals and you got to get a timeline because you can't probably do it all at once. And then the next step is flipping the switch and making the change. Once again, you know, over time, uh, you start you know, bringing on the new technology or bringing on a new process. And at some point, as, it, as, as all that technology is getting embedded into the, uh, into the business, now you have to really embed and see change, and to change your own internal processes to utilize the new technology. And then finally, uh, finally you kind of take a step back uh, after it's all implemented and the business is running more efficiently, you assess, did we do the right thing? Did that change work? So that's business. How could we apply something like that to, to just our own, our own personal life? So let's take, uh, let's take the example of maybe we wanna change jobs. So how do we as individuals, how do we prepare for change? Well, you know, we as Christians, we know how to do this, right? We have faith. We study the word. We live in a godly manner. We depend on our, on our congregation and our friends to help us through these changes. That's how we prepare for any change. We as Christians, we're prepared for change. Now, so you prepare for change. The next step is you make a plan. Well, what does that plan involve? I want to change jobs. I want to go do something else in this area. So what do you do? Well, you start searching for jobs and you start interviewing, and you get told, I've done this, you get told no time and time again. Nobody ever calls you back. You know, I mean, it's the toughest thing to do to try to go out and get a new job. But if you have faith, that keeps you strong, that keeps you going, and eventually one day you're gonna get an offer and you're gonna accept it. You flip the switch, now it's time to go to the new job. Well, now that's another challenge. Because, you know, maybe the new job wants you to go into the office and work versus teleworking all the time. That could be a challenge, you know, but you meet new people. There's new processes. It could be frustrating. You could be nervous. You could be scared. How are you going to get through that? Trust in the Lord. You've done it thus far. Keep trusting him to carry you on. And then finally, and then the next step, you kind of got to embed yourself into the new job. You really get in, you start making a change, and you start affecting the, those around you. You do that in the glory of God. And finally, you step back, and you realize, you know, I did it. I changed. And you look across that whole process, and the Lord helped you every step of the way. He was there. See, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, that's the constant. No matter what goes on in this world, that's the constant. Jesus is there for us to lean on, to draw strength from, to help us all along the way. Jesus is there to help us through the changes in life. Now, there's this thing called inflection points. Now, inflection points are a point in time where something drastic changes, something very different changes. 
and it changes the course of life. So let's take, for example, uh, I'm a, yeah, we're going to sing about this later on, but for now, I'll just tell you, I, you know, I'm a student of a military history, and over, uh, over time, uh, different weapons have, uh, the changes in the technology have changed the way wars were fought. The crossbow, before the crossbow came out, all the, it was just uh, clubs and spears and swords. Uh, there were arrows, but not anything with the velocity. The crossbow, uh, and, and so to protect the self, the soldiers would wear armor or, or heavy leather. But because of the crossbow, uh, it made all of that personal protection obsolete. So war was changed, how wars were fought changed. Gunpowder, it did the same thing, how wars were fought changed. Now let's take uh, uh, an industry, the cotton gin. Now first of all, the cotton gin changed the way that, that cotton was produced and, and, gone and, and distributed into the textiles industry. Oh, the automated process to separate the, the cotton from the, uh, from the seed. And it, it made more rapid getting cotton into the textile industry. It really changed that industry. But it was part of the Industrial Revolution. A bunch of different uh, processes were going from being automated to being, uh, to being manual to being automated. Industrial Revolution changed the world forever. The airplane changed forever how we travel. What took four or five days now took two or three hours. Changed the way, changed the world forever. 9-11. 9-11 hit forever how we travel. The security of, of how we travel has changed. See, it's these inflection points that happen that change the world forever. Now, in all of creation, in all of time, in all of history, the single most important inflection point that 32 or three years that Jesus lived on the earth, died for us, and rose. That's an inflection point. See, the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. He died for us. Now, some portions of the Bible talk about he, uh, Jesus descending. And, and he preached and saved all of the righteous souls that came prior, waiting for the promise of God for this resurrection. And then Jesus was re resurrected and then he ascended. And what he gave us for the first time, what he gave us was the ability to live a life eternal. See, not only do we have this beautiful life we're living in, but because of Jesus, because of the great change agent, he gave us the opportunity for a life everlasting. Now, that is an inflection point, and that's change, real change. So um, we just finished Pentecost. Uh, and uh, t traditionally, and especially in Europe, uh, it's still a banking holiday, the Monday after Pentecost was called at one point Whit Monday. So Whit Monday, uh, back in the 1800s, was a big celebration. And of course, the church birthday on Sunday, Monday was more geared toward kids. And the tradition was one village would, um, would, uh, would host a big celebration for children, where there were a, it was a party and there were songs and there were games and it was a big celebration on Whit Monday. So in the 18, uh, in 1870s, uh, uh, a reverend by the name of Sabine uh, Baron Gould, uh, he was right outside of Yorkshire. He was in charge of, of the Whit, taking his uh, group, group of, uh, of kids over to the next village for Whit Monday celebration. So he wanted to do something special. So he stayed up at night and he pinned this little ditty and he was, going to he was going to teach it to his children the next day and they were going to sing this as they hiked over and marched over to the next village. Now he said it wasn't his best rhyme, but what he pinned that night and taught those children on their way uh, to sing on the way uh, to the celebration Onward, Christian soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers. 
And it was a kid's tune. You know, beneath the cross of Jesus, raising the cross in front of them, raising the banners in front of them. They put the Lord out there. And they marched to their celebration. Onward, Christian soldiers. Now, when I, when I hear the story and I think about it, I envision this. You know, you, you raise your cross. Your, whatever cross that may be. For mine, it's kind of an old rugged cross. It could be a bright and shining cross. Whatever that is on your heart. How you, you live with, your, with, with, with Christ. Raise it in front of you. Raise that cross. Raise that banner. And what that does for me is it forms protection. It forms, it forms armor that I can go out and, and, and deal with all the change in the world if I just raise my cross in front of me. So um, Mahatma Gandhi said, uh, said this, or credited as saying this, be the change that you want to see in the world. You want to see change? Just like our scripture says, let it go. Let the old ways go so you can be that change you want to see in the world. A lot of change out there, but you can affect it. You can be part of it. Be that change. So change is coming right to us here in a couple weeks. We're going to receive Reverend Brooke. She's going to come in here with great ideas, with her new seed. She's going to plant that seed, and together, this church, like we've done in the past, it's going to grow. We're going to have new ideas. It's going to be great. Change is coming, and we are prepared. But we all know you leave these doors, and there's all kind of change out in that world. It affects us every day. How are you going to deal with it? Lift up your cross. Put it out in front of you. Know that when you walk out there, you are armed with the Spirit. And Jesus Christ, who's there forever, will be by your side. Change. It's okay. Amen.